Well, a few weeks ago, before the Olympic Games, I was lucky enough to catch up on Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans, who deal with anyone in Australia. They've got clients in every state and capital city with Jared Whiteley, who got the opportunity to call the athletics for the host broadcaster in Australia, Channel 9. And uh, Jared's been good enough. And also, I thank him very much for uh, jumping on again. He's only returned from Paris less than two days ago. He's a bit jet lagged, but uh, the true professional he is. He's jumped on and done. 360 last night, the AFL, and uh, he thought, well, we might as well have a chat about the Olympic Games and the experience that he had. Jared, welcome. Great to have you back in the country. Dan, terrific to be back. Oh, I'm just actually back from the track and field from the school. Uh, the Benji's athletics days today, so I just can't get enough of it. And tell me about uh, doing that after, obviously, the experience of doing the Olympic Games. Do you think you're an expert now? It's funny watching watching the 200s and knowing that they've just got to balance up around the bend and the uh, Benji's teachers doing the commentary over the loudspeaker. And you know, I know what all of this is about. No, that was it was good fun. It's hard to believe it that it's it's sort of been and gone. It's been so long in the planning, and uh, it was spectacular. What what a city Paris was for it, and. Other than the the weather for the opening ceremony, pretty and not being able to swim in the sand that day, is everything pretty well went or was carried off just the way that you would like a games to be. It was it was a great games. And you've been to a few now. Is it the best one? Yeah, so I think um, Sydney, London, and Paris are the modern markers. Yeah. Uh, is is where I would sit, and Paris used its. I think it used its landmarks and its iconic history better than any other city I've ever been to. Uh, London reminded itself what a great city it was. And then I think the the conviviality and the, the excitement around Sydney was distinct. So they, they've, they've all had their absolute markers. But yeah, as Paris soared, it soared in the way that they staged events under the Eiffel Tower and in the Grand Palais and uh, the choice of the marathon course and some of the shots from the road cycling was absolute genius, the way that they put it together. When you got there, I know you're obviously still doing your homework and uh, you and I discussed how much homework you'd done and it, it obviously stood you in good stead because it was great even very early on, Jared, when you had the preliminary heats of uh, the sprints and those countries that we don't know much about, you were giving us great information. I said, gee, Jared's gone beyond the call here. So the first week, was it spent mainly just doing your homework or did you get a chance to have a look at some events? Yeah, no, I felt like I'd done all the work that I wanted to by the time I landed. So I had a lot to do on the plane, so I used that that time well. And then I was determined just to spend a few days enjoying it. Uh, so I landed on the Saturday, so the morning after the opening ceremony, which was a bit of a rainy day. And then from the Sunday, I, I went to venues. So I went to the... Uh, I started at the beach volleyball because that, I think that's the, the iconic image that will last and yeah. and went and sat under the Eiffel Tower uh, and went to Roland Garros that day as Rafael Nadal was playing. I've never been to Roland Garros, so it's been a bucket list item and Nadal was playing. So you walk into, into the venue and there's this incredible silver statue, a very futuristic statue of Nadal. And then to be able to walk through and to watch him play on centre court was brilliant. Uh, I went and saw Jess Fox win her second gold medal at the at the Salem Canoe Course, which was about um, sort of in the, the leafy eastern suburbs, a village about an hour and a, about an hour and 20 minutes out and a couple of trains and then parade through the village down to the river where the rowing was on one side and they built the Slalom canoe on the other. And the beauty of that was you could be right on the banks. Um, so they, they built the temporary grandstands on the far side and then all the official and the media setup was on the near side. So you could walk up and down about 80 metres of the course, sort of follow Jess from about, you know, about gate eight to gate 17. Um, and her mum was running down the course in front of us. So that was just an absolutely spectacular view and something that I'll always think really fondly of because Jess is one of the defining figures of the game and um, of these games. I went to Paris Saint-Germain's home ground to watch some football. So that's um, Park de Princess, so Princess Park, which owed a lot to the... It owed a lot to the 80s grounds that, that we spent our childhood at, yes. uh, childhoods at and could use a bit of a lick of paint. And I think I still think the best thing I did was 
the Grand Palais where they staged the fencing was just utterly spectacular. The way that it it have a half a billion dollar renovation. Um, they put the temporary grandstands on either side. The um, combatants would come down an ornate staircase, swords drawn, and tapping them as they came out onto the onto the mats. Um, and there's just an ornate backdrop for something that you wouldn't typically go to. It was brilliant. It's just brilliant. And I got to the swimming to see Leon Marchand, who is the defining figure of France at these games, and he won his first gold medal in the 400 IM, which is as dominant swim as I've ever seen. And that crowd, about 60 metres into the race, everyone just leapt from their seats. They couldn't contain themselves anymore. And on the third leg, which was the breaststroke, is just every time he would stick his head above the surface, they would sort of roar, just this really punctuated roar at him so he could hear the crowd. And then when he turned into the freestyle, he was so far in front, it was a victory lap. And that, the anthem, um, when he was presented with his gold medal there, that that's as stirring an anthem as I've ever heard. So, yeah, I got to take a lot in before we settled in at the stadium. In regard to Jess Fox, you'll go down as one of the all-time greats. She just has uh, nerves of steel, doesn't she? She is magnificent. Yeah, that, yeah. That uh, performance in the K1 when she was the, the fifth runner in the final after not a great leg in the in the semi, and then she just had to sit and wait. I mean, that was just an unbelievable performance, and we know what the C1 final was like. She's a superstar, isn't she? Yeah, I think that's right, is that that idea of nerves of steel. So she won them in two different ways. One, yeah. she had to make amends for a semi-final and, and then lay down a time which was just superior. So she had to wait them out. And then um, in the one I was at is there was a time that was set re- uh, pretty well halfway through yeah. that no one got anywhere near until she took to the course and she beat it by four and a bit seconds. And they even sort of subsequently applied a two second penalty and just reduced the margin of victory. So yeah, that, and that's, that's the glory of elite sport is when the pressure's at its maximum and it demands the performance, she was able to do that repeatedly and, um, and she'd also taken all the risks, I think, is she was the, the face of the games from an Australian perspective. She was the first face and voice on Channel 9's broadcast. She carried the flag the day before competition. So she gave herself over to it, and then she still delivered her sporting performances. There's been, there'd be plenty who wouldn't be brave enough to take it all on, and there'd be plenty who weren't good enough to deliver against that, and she did both. So she becomes one of our modern day greats in the in the theatre at the Olympics. Jared Whiteley has joined me to review the Olympic Games. Of course, he called the track and field for Channel Nine for Dashing Down's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans. They've got over twenty five lenders on their panel. Jared, to the track and field now. What was the stadium like? Was it what you thought it would be? It was brilliant. Um, it, it's everything that a national stadium should be. Seventy plus thousand. It was full. Day and night, day and night for all nine days of the program. Um, it 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 captures its sound really well. So it's such a clever design is that the roof hangs right over toward the field so that the crowd is totally under the roof and then uh, the, the natural light and the weather gets in there. Um, and such enthusiastic and knowledgeable crowds and, and into everything. So the night that um, the track, program had finished but Mondo Duplanta was, was still going in the pole vault and not a single person had left wow. and uh, when he leapt the world record it was just it might have been the biggest roar of all through through the nine days and nights um, yeah so a, a good a good reminder of what a great stadium is and how central that is to an Olympic Games and and a bit of a warning for Brisbane that you can't be staging the athletics at the Olympics at what looks like a school venue. You need something with some real grandeur to it. Um, and I think there'd be there'd be a few people who would have come back and gone, okay, so the plans that we've got are just not going to cut it, not when it comes to, to track and field at an Olympics. You need to find a great venue. And, I mean, even if they do the gather up, no good, is it? Or not up to scratch. No good's the wrong word, Jared. No, it? they'd have to rebuild it. Yeah, they'd have to rebuild it. So and and you know, Brisbane chronically needs a rebuilt stadium anyway. I don't I don't think the gap is the best idea. That Victoria Park idea seems like the perfect solution. But mm-hmm. I mean, we've just seen in the past couple of days, Cricket Australia are leaving them off the long term schedule and the Brisbane Lions have outgrown the ground. And yeah. you've got to have something that in fifty years' time you we're all telling our 
grandkids or oh, this was the Olympic venue in Brisbane. So it's just part and parcel of it. And um, yeah, and the, the Stade de France was just, it was epic. When we spoke before the Games, we always talked about the 100 metres being the big events. We always thought there might be some controversy. Plenty of controversy in the women's 100 metres. Um, Shelley Ann Price didn't get to the start line. Uh, what's your take on all of that? Uh, well, it's still a bit unclear, Dan, isn't it? Um, yeah. It was a shock on the night. And then, you know, the, the video of the, the squabble at the bus and the changed conditions of getting to the warm-up track. And then she never addressed whether she was injured or not. And uh, we know she didn't subsequently run in the relay. So clearly there was a hamstring issue as well as everything else that was going on. But yeah, what an incredible backdrop to it. And she had looked good in the heat, uh, better than I imagined that she was going to look. So, I mean, Jamaica had a terrible time of things. It's between Shelly Ann Fraser-Price and then Sharika Jackson withdrawing first from the 100 and then from the 200 with the hamstring injury that she had sustained. They didn't win a gold medal. There were on the track, there were uh, relay teams that didn't qualify and then there were relay teams that dropped the baton and so really a disaster for Jamaica in the, the changeover and then, you know, their their main hope lost by a margin that you could still barely believe. So, yeah, I was I had a bit of a giggle. If Don Argus was still doing reviews and reports, he might be seconded to Jamaica to work out what's happening with their sprint ranks. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, they, they did struggle. The interesting thing about the relays, and I spoke to Ebony Lane uh, for Dashing Down to Olympic Adventures before the Games, for Aussie Home Lines, Gerrit, and in the end, she didn't get a run. She was the uh, reserve for the Australian team. But because their team had been known a long way out, they'd practice the baton changes. Now, obviously, with teams like Jamaica and USA, they'll pick their best sprinters. You won't see them probably in the earlier heats, will you? You'll see them in the final. But they may not have the chemistry in regard to the baton change, and that probably went against Jamaica in a lot of ways. Well, and I think definitely the US. So the men's 4x100 team just sort of oozes arrogance and they mm. botch the first change. Is mm. Coleman's the best 60-metre runner in the world and he was out and flying and they all took off too soon and just crashed into each other and got disqualified. So that that was hopeless, to be honest. It's, it's fine to have the best sprinters in the world, but you have to get the baton around. So, yeah, I think there's a, 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 an attention to detail which... And it's hardly the first time it had happened to the US in recent times in that event as well. So, yeah, that that definitely plays a role as some nations are committed. I think you could look through Canada's form and go, every time the US mucks it up, Canada wins. And that's because there's a, a diligence to what they do, I suspect, is they've figured it out. We're not quite as fast, but we're going to be more cohesive in in the handoffs and not lose time and not get DQ'd and not run out of the lane and so yeah is that that was a really interesting part to it they're they're, they're absolutely electric the the relay particularly the four by ones because they just happen so quickly and so much can go wrong and then the, the four by fours are are a bit more of a study in um in less raw raw power and a, and a bit more sort of grace and and the way that the, the women of the US dominated that race, just for a moment, they looked like they'd break the old Soviet Union mark from from Seoul, and they only missed it by one-tenth of a second. So, yeah, as the the vagaries of the relays were there for all of us to um, take fright at or admire. Going into the games, did you think Alfred of St. Lucia would do as well as she's done? I mean, she's won a gold and the silver. She couldn't do much better. No, she was my sneaky tip in the 100. If yeah. if I'd been a gambling man, I would have had something on her. Um, and she had Shikari Richardson covered in the semi-final. So I thought going into the final, she was the winner. Um, and then, I mean, she ran out of her skin in the 200 as well. It was, it was Gabby Thomas, it was her time. And, and she was absolutely phenomenal. But I did love the, I thought, I felt like the two, you know, for what that meant to St. Lucia and, and some of the scenes that we saw from there, which was then one-upped by Botswana yes. when Let's Silly Thabogo won the 200 and the half-day holiday, and you would have seen in the last 24 hours, they filled their 30,000-seat stadium in Botswana for his return and paraded yeah. him around in front of a capacity crowd. I mean, that's and that sort of takes us right to the heart of it all, doesn't it, is one athlete who provides glory and a the long-awaited gold medal in a prestigious event 
the heroic homecoming and the tens of thousands who go out to share in it. Um, I just thought those were glorious scenes. So they, they yeah, Julian Alfred and Let Silly Tobogo have such a special place in what happened in Paris. And it defines their country, um, not just their own deeds, but yeah, it, it, it really furthers the, the national character of a couple of countries that that's that bask in their in their glories. Now the men's 100 meters, great call, Jared. Uh, it was well, it was a dead heat. I mean, wasn't it really. Yes. I know, I know, I know Noah, Noah Lyle's got it, but did you think it was a dead heat? You couldn't, you couldn't pick between them. Yeah, I think we'd actually spoken about this down. It did sort of chime somewhere in my mind. It, it's, if you can't see a margin, then yeah, we did. that becomes the greatest drama of all. Yes, and that's what happened for the next. So I got told a story, and I I do believe believe this to be true. Is the um the judge for for want of a better term, so we're using racing parlance, mm. I, I think she's Australian, and she resolved that race in twenty seven seconds, and then it was held. She didn't hold it back, but it got held back for theatrical effect to let the drama build and build and build as both were looking to the score. But I don't think she was super impressed that it was held back in such a way. But it was that as soon as he hit the line, you just realised that these two were going to end up standing together, possibly arm in arm, looking up at the scoreboard, waiting for an eternity to find out which of them had won it. And the difference between winning and losing in that moment, it was imperceptible to the eye, but it will mean everything to their legacy and to their lives. And so the magnitude of all of that is the drama wasn't just the 9.79 seconds. It was the three minutes afterwards as the world sort of gasped and waited and, and you get to sort of focus on them both. And just even their interactions where Lyles thought that Kishan had probably won it and, um, and then what it all means when it flashed up on the board and the fact that the two times came up identical and then you get told that it's five one thousandth of a second and then trying to make sense of what that margin is um yeah for and it look it's probably the best race ever run is all 10 all all eight under 10 seconds the tightest spread in olympic history 0.12 between all eight of them and that was exaggerated because oblique seville throws his head back and gives up at the end so he actually should have been tighter in that finish it would have been even closer um, fastest times ever for fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, like that. That had the absolute maximum drama to it that, that you wouldn't dare have scripted. I don't think. I was speaking to Glenn Mitchell after the games as well for Dashing Games Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loan Stewart, and he said, "You think of Kashane Thompson, and he's a silver medalist, which is a great effort, but he's the closest to being a gold medalist that you possibly could be." And you look at. Uh, Lyles, Lyles has won it, and uh, he could have been a silver medalist. I mean, that's that's how tight it was. I mean, we'll never get a race as tight as that, will we? I don't think. Probably not. Probably not. You'd love to see as, you know, track and field has these these big ambitions, and I think, well, they should. Um, mm. You'd love to see the eight of them put back on the blocks in six months' time in Madison Square Garden or, or somewhere for the world to watch again. I, I reckon we'd all tune in to see just what it might look like. Um, but yeah, is that the difference between winning and losing is just so narrow in that instance, but so profound. And Keyshane Thompson, he, he certainly got the time. He, he'll plot his way to LA. And if he's still that athlete, he might get his gold medal there. But this was Lyle's time. Um, and he had to run faster than he'd ever run before. And Keyshane didn't quite run as fast as he had earlier this year. And there's only a heartbeat in it, but... Yeah. That, that that was the difference. So, yeah, I think as um, as an illustration of everything that goes on the line in the Olympics and just how tight it can all be, we'll never get a better one than that. And you would have seen some of the photography from it, whether it's the overhead as they're all lunging or the front on when they're all there. Um, yeah, you, you could you could stage that race for the next 100 years and, and not get something that looked anything like it. How crook do you think Lyles was for the 200 metres? I mean, yeah. he, he uh, had COVID. I, there were a lot of athletes that got COVID, not only from an Australian perspective, but uh, from a world perspective. It was just a bit unfortunate because he could have won the 100, 200 double and 200 is probably his, uh, his better event if, if he has a better event, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, well that that is his pet event. It's the event he's dominated since Tokyo. So it's terribly unfortunate timing, and, and just as well that it didn't happen before the hundred, or it would have ruined his whole games. Um, he won a bronze medal, sort of deeply affected by COVID in the two hundred, which is phenomenal in its own right. I reckon you could tell in the semi-finals he didn't because he got beaten in the semi-final of the hundred by Oblique Seville. You know, is he kidding to them? He just didn't look right in the semi-final yeah. and Tobogo handled him quite easily. Uh, and uh, Tamsin had said to me off air that um, Tobogo would beat him on the final in the final on what we'd seen. And then there was just that one shot of him with the mask on from the call room. And that was when you went, ah, something's not right here. And when he collapsed the track and he just couldn't get air into the lungs. So phenomenal Phenomenal to win a bronze medal in those circumstances. And I think clearly he was sick. Now, Tobogo's run out of his skin, um, but that time, Lyles has that easily covered at his best. And I would say to you, he was at his best prior to COVID. So, yeah, I think it's really unfortunate. I think it's great that he got the 100 and we don't want to take anything away from Let's Silly, but it, it's part of the legend in a way and, and the story that will get told in the next series of Sprint on Netflix, not just the triumph of the 100, but then all the drama that, that happens afterwards. I presume they will have captured all of it and we'll be able to see it play out for ourselves. I think I might know the answer to this. And Jared Waitley's joined me on Dashing Down's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans to talk about his wonderful experience of calling the track and field in Paris. The 100, 200 metres for men and women, was that your favourite event? Or was it the 1,500 metres involving Australian Jess Hull? Yeah, so I think it ends up being Hull. So uh, yeah. my, my favourite three, I think, at the moment is is the men's 100 for all that went into it. Yeah. I thought Sydney mclaughlin Lavrone breaking the world record in the 400 hurdles was just as good as, as good as you would ever see as just an exhibition of dominance and, and, and something that hadn't been done before. And then, yeah, our games was always funneling toward the last individual event. And Jess had looked so good in the heat and so good in the semi that you just knew that this was right on. So it was, in a way, it was an unwinnable gold medal because Faith Kipiagon is the best, the best middle distance runner that the female discipline's ever seen. Yep. Um, but Jess was always winning a medal in that on and what we'd seen in the build-up. And then you have to go out and deliver the performance. And she did. She ran that race brilliantly. She was just a fraction further back when they settled than she would have liked. So she slid around, moved up into third. She was in the medals the whole way through. You could pretty well have scripted that Kip Yagan would run away from them on the bend. And that's what happened. Then Jess goes past Welteji uh, and Bell finishes off with the Brits. But yeah, I felt like she was always winning silver in that race and a huge triumph. And I think everybody recognised what that was, is sometimes the best medals aren't gold. And if you think through 27 nations won gold medals at the track and field and 42 medals in total. So that's a totally different proposition to what's happening in other sports. It's truly global. And the fact that the three benchmarks are not only icons of Australian sport, but icons of Australian life in Edwin Flack, John Landy and Herb Elliott, you, you could recognise what she was attempting to do. And I do feel like she got the she got the instant recognition and she got the satisfaction from it. As she had a brilliant six weeks in the lead up, redefined her, perfectly timed campaign, and she's got the spoils for it. So yeah, to have the opportunity to to offer something to that is the way that that built is that that's something I'll always treasure. She was just unfortunate that she's come up against the best of all time. And you win consecutive gold medals at three Olympic Games in an event like the 1500 metres. You are an all-time great, if not the greatest, as you said, Jerry. Yes, yeah. So only Usain Bolt has done that on the track. So mm -hmm. that that gave you an instant reference point as just to how how historic this is. And other than the fact that, you know, I suppose if you're choosing between gold and silver, you would choose gold. It does mean that Jess wins that breakthrough medal for Australia in a race that will never be forgotten. The international accolades, there were just people in our media area just standing and applauding Kip Yagon's feet. So, yeah, it was um, it was so fulfilling to see that and for Jess to be a big part of that. And the, the camaraderie that existed in the aftermath is they all 
they revere Kip Yagon for what she's been able to do, not only on the track, but she had her first child and then came back and has won gold medals since. So she sets a standard that raises the profile of that event and the sport and they, all of the other women sort of share in that and revere her for it. So they were lovely scenes in the aftermath. And I did like, Jess said that she couldn't have been happier if she'd won gold. And that I think that was the sense that we all had around it is that was the, the what was on offer to her was to win the silver medal and create some history. And, and she did it. I thought she did it superbly. Would you think, Jared, that she'd be there in LA in 2028? Would you think Kippy Agon would be there? And if not, I mean, I know uh, it doesn't automatically mean because she won silver to one of the all-time greats four years earlier that she's going to win gold. But if everything stays as is and she's there in LA and Kippy Agon's not, she'd be some chance, wouldn't she, of winning that gold? Yeah, so I've been thinking about this as well, and without imposing it on Jess, as you go, if this if it was in two years' time, you'd go, uh, you know, she'll graduate from silver to gold. So let, if we took a guess and mm-hmm. use Bolt as the trajectory, is that's probably the peak for for Faith Kipyagon, and she'll either retire or um, or diminish just in the natural course of things. So Jess is twenty seven, so she'll be, she'll be thirty one in. Right. Uh, in LA, and I haven't got it all in front of me. Uh, and Faith was thirty at these games, so yes, is and Jess has just made the breakthrough in the last two months for all the work that she's done and the maturing and the learning the race and the strategy of it. And so my gut feeling seeing here is yes, is in four years' time that might be her. So Kathy laid she laid the foundations in Atlanta and then one in Sydney and. Yep. Sally laid them in uh, Beijing and one in London. So I think he could make a reasonable case that that that's a possibility without sort of overlaying the next four years on Jess. But yeah, she's reached the point where uh, she has such control over what's happening in those races now, notwithstanding that, you know, um, Bell was terrific from Great Britain and you just never know what will arrive on the scene. But yeah. I think that's very possible. If it was in two years' time, I'd feel super confident. Four years is a four years is a long time. But if Jess dedicates herself to that, I could absolutely see that happening in LA. What about the other Australians uh, in the track events? Were you satisfied with how they performed? Did uh, they exceed yours and Tamsin's expectations, or reach yours and Tamsin's expectations? So I think when we spoke, is the possibility of our teenagers. Um, having their first Olympic experience in great style, that happened. So Tori Lewis ran a PB in her heat of the 200, went straight through to the semifinals. Claudia Hollingsworth, uh, so good in her heat, straight through to the semifinals. Peyton Craig, same in the 800, ripper of a race. And then he either ran ran the PB there or he ran the PB in in the semifinal. So absolutely perfect way to start your Olympic career and set yourself up for what's to come on trajectories that will climax in Brisbane. So the possibility of making finals in LA and then being a really, a really prominent figure on the blocks in Brisbane. So I thought those three did absolutely everything that you would have hoped for. And then Abby Caldwell won a repercharge, um, and uh, there was another repercharge charge win along. So, uh, yes, I thought that the core of the future were terrific. Um, the problem with the here and the now, as we touched on, is Rowan Browning has been injured all year and Peter Bowl just hasn't been the same athlete since the, the bungled doping mm. saga. And they both ran like that. It was, Browning was nowhere and he spoke about that in the aftermath. And it's really hard because... In the cycle, if, if you get injury in the Olympic year, it just doesn't give you any chance. And Bowl was comforting himself, as he should with being an Olympian again, but he's nowhere near the athlete that we saw in Tokyo. So they were sort of foreseeable and and unfortunate. And you just can't, like, you can't fluke your Olympic performances. You have to have it all in order. You have to have been able to do the work. And I just don't think in either instance they'd been able to get the work in. So... Yeah, it was a bit of a mixed bag. And poor, poor Michelle Jenica, who was brilliant over the first two hurdles um, and then crashed at the third like, and crashed you know, spectacularly and was injured and bravely came out in the repercharge, charge but just could barely go. So that was so unfortunate because I, I feel like she was in for a really good run, certainly in that 
that heat and maybe beyond. So, yeah, I feel like we we lived the whole mixed bag, didn't we? We sure did. Can Peter Bowl come back, Jared? Or you're worried, well, or your con- concerns, probably a better word, isn't it, in regard to sport? Are you concerned that we might have seen the best of him? Yeah, I feel like that. That's up to him, isn't it? And just what what toll this has all taken. So it's 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 had a huge impact on his enjoyment of the sport um, and his comfort in it. So I don't know. I don't know whether you can put that aside now that the Olympic cycle's over. And four years is such a long way away um, when you're in those circumstances. So yeah, I I would probably. I think the eight hundred has now changed hands as. Um, Peyton Craig will break those the records of Deng and Bowl in the short term. It is he's totally on his way, um, and, and so that's exciting on one front and unfortunate on another front. But yeah, I, I it, it would be a huge effort to to get back to the pointy end that he was when he was fourth in an Olympic final. Can I ask you from a calling perspective? And you and Tamsin worked really well together. Watching a lot of the track and field athletics, especially the heats, it was a little bit late for a lot of us, obviously, in the middle of the morning. Yeah. But I'm a bit of a night owl, so I, I saw a lot. You would get, let's say, a 400 metres hurdle, then you get a 5,000 metre race. So how tough was it, Jared? And particularly early days, or how challenging was it early days to get your head around doing a sprint race and then doing a middle distance race? Yeah, so the first day, the first session, my head was spinning at the end of it. So um, I'd had a, uh, I, I'd, I'd thought it through a lot because on day one you're calling um, heats of the hundred, and then you finish the day calling the ten thousand. So th- those are the extremes of it. So I'd thought about it a lot, but it was just, it was just so it came at you so ferociously and. As soon as they'd finished this set, you're onto your next folder and your next folder are races that are going to go two and three minutes. So it just took me a little bit to get the, um, to, just to be able to transfer from one to the next to the next. But the work that it done is, and as you well know, is that the craft is totally different as you just, you've got nine seconds for this race and then you've got 30 minutes for this race. Um, and then once you got to the, once you've been doing a lap, or two laps, then it's beautiful. And you sort of got a lot of time to set them up and follow them around. And the 1500s were glorious. You could work in and out of Tams. And, and so, yeah, it, it took a little, just a little bit to get the, um, just to settle because it all happened so quickly on morning one. And then once we were the other side of the, the 100 final for men, it was it was just a bit of a righto. I've got I, I know exactly what we're doing now, and and in a way you sort of threw the most pressure packed, and those were the most fun days where you could throw it around a little bit and have a little bit of fun and just have the comfort of knowing what was going on, and yeah, so they're they're wildly different, and it's so gosh, it's so um what what a what a spread to be able to get is the race that goes 9.79 and the race that goes two hours and 27 minutes in the same discipline. So yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. And there was, I remember there was a point you're going, ah, oh, this is just such great fun. And you've now sort of got it pegged as to what the rhythms of it are, what the pace of it is. And, um, and then you can sort of play with your craft from there. Greatest thing you've ever done. I mean, I, I, Asked you this yeah. question before. I mean, you've done a lot of great things in your career, but is this number one now? It is, yeah. And it sort of felt like it probably was going to be. And it was even bigger than I, I – so I was set for it to be big, and it was even bigger. It's a bit like – it is like going and calling the grand final in the morning, coming home and having a nap, and then going and calling the grand final again at night yeah. and do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Is so you're in this elevated environment every time that you go back, and there's there's just so much work to do between sessions to to be ready and um yeah. So it was an it was incredibly challenging. It was just so, but it was so great to be in the middle of. And it does. I thought the whole games, not just the track and field, it just reminded us that. Um, the Olympics operates on an elevated plane and it's a while since we've been able to experience that, but it captivates all of us and the spread of sports and the stories and the possibilities and the, the heartache that's involved in the moments of triumph. It is different to everything else. And it's just a bit bigger than everything else as 
not that that diminishes grand final day in no. any way because it means so much to all of us, but the Olympics is special. It's rare. Um, and I just, yeah, I, it was a, it was a great reminder. We hadn't had a great games for a while, but this was a great games and yeah, the Olympics does stay special and, and yeah, to, I mean, when you get to our age, it, it's, it's not often that you're getting to do something for the first time. Um, so it was, yeah, it was just, it was glorious to be a part of. And I will always think fondly of it. It's a nice early 50. I know you turned 50 in October, Jared, if you don't mind me saying, but yeah. it's a nice early 50th birthday present for you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Now that it's, now that it's done and you can reflect on it, um, you can reflect on it as, as being fulfilling. Um, it is, it's, you know, gosh, it's, it's something I'll never forget. And who knows what the world is, is like in four years time. So I did take a moment to just sort of cherish it and breathe it in and, um, yeah, and be able to share it. I mean, that's the uh, – to be able to share it with people back home and to be able to tell those stories is, you know, I did want to – I meant to mention Reese Holder in there who yeah. is on the cusp of breaking Darren Clark's revered 400-metre record. It's yeah. just suddenly these things just come in front of you and you go, right, so we're – we're now following Reese Holder as I presume that he'll break Clark's record in the next 12 months. And what a moment that is. Think about how long that record has stood for. And then we go on his journey towards LA. So yeah. Yeah. I, I, I loved every minute of it. The, the, the track is amplified at a point in history, like we haven't experienced before. And, and I hope that they seize it. I hope the likes of Gabby Thomas and, and Noah Lyles are able to propel track to be something more than just once every four years and really crack the mainstream in the US and I think the quality of racing that we saw gives them all that chance. First time you worked with Tamsin Lewis from day one it was like yeah. you'd work together every day of your life. <laughs> I mean I interviewed her as well for Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans and a great talent gee, gee she's good isn't she? She's so good and yeah. she's absolutely brilliant with the way that she does it. So she's got two, the two streams, which is very rare. So she's got the technical and she's got the tactical and she's got the times and she can explain to you what's happening in a race, but then she takes the time to learn the stories of the athletes. So which gives you a chance to have an emotional stake in something as simple as this guy loves to wear character socks in his races. And this guy's mum passed away earlier this year and everything is dedicated. So she gave us the whole gamut of what you could buy into um, so that you felt like over the course of a race, oh, I love this guy's story or I hope she wins for this reason. I, that she she was so brilliant on that front. And I always think when you, when you sit with the best expert commentators, you learn. So you're not just calling together, but you're actually learning from them. And I learned so much across those 11 days. So I know that everybody watching did as well because she was she was teaching me, so she was teaching everybody. Yeah, I I loved our time together and we had a lot of time together. She's, she's hilarious. Um, and she was coming back. I've been at the school sports today. She was there yesterday. So she got back Tuesday night wow. and she's the head of sport at Strathcona. And she had their school athletics day. So she was straight back to the track. And honestly, I read that she couldn't, she would not have been happier being anywhere else in the world other than at the track the day after getting home from the Olympics. And she would have hit the ground running and she would have dominated yep. as she does uh, in, in a lovely, friendly way. Absolutely no doubt about that. Now, now, Jared, other than doing the laundry, of which uh, Robbo was absolutely obsessed about <laughs> last night on 360, typical Robbo, uh, in the first couple of days when you're just getting used to the pace of it all, did you have a chance to relax in the afternoon in Paris or in the evening Australian time in between the morning so, and it, night sessions? Was that so I, I, I rushed to venues in the first few days to make sure that I had an Olympic experience before the yeah. stadium. Yeah. And then once, um, once the track started uh they were 20 hour days oh, i've never worked harder at anything and and just every minute between sessions so i had an idea of the way i wanted to do things and i realized after the first day that that wasn't going to be possible because there just weren't enough minutes between sessions so i just made a quick adjustment but no as we would get um you'd be on a, an 8 a.m bus you get back about half past one uh, work you had to the Tamsin taught me how to do it so you have to work one session ahead so in the afternoon you would prepare tomorrow's morning session 
Right. And then when you got home at night, you would prepare tomorrow night's session. You had to get one session ahead. You can't, you couldn't live hand to mouth. And so that took just every minute that was available. And um, you, you're on fumes by the end of it, but it's the adrenaline that kicks in and, and takes you through. So that was, it was good to see what I wanted to see beforehand because once it, once it locked in, it was, I knew it would be, um, relentless but it was actually yeah it's it, it was it just took so much to be able to be ready session to session which um you, you know i love that part of it but i've never been not since cramming for exams have i been under such time pressure to be ready to catch the bus um with all the work that i wanted to get done i could just imagine jared but knowing you you're so organized you would have been on time unlike me you used to I remember the lunch, I was always running. I used to get there, but I was always off and running late for the bus with the, the late great Mr. Morford in tow with me as well, getting stuck into me about us being late. But anyway, that's a story for another day. Uh, the field performances, obviously you were covering the the, the track and um, Steve and, and Dave were covering the field, but great efforts by Australia and, of course, in the walk as well. Uh, we did really well there, didn't we? Yeah, got everything that was possible. And yeah. this this generation had wanted to win more than six medals. So 12 is obviously the historic marker from Melbourne, but twice uh, in the in the generations gone by that the athletics team had got to six, this generation was desperate to get to seven, and they did. Um, and they did that because everybody delivered against what was possible. So Nina Ken the, the night that Nina Kennedy was over on the left jumping the, the pole vault and Matt Denny was on the right in the discus circle, it was such a great night. And we're trying to call track events whilst watching when the Australians came up and um, and Dave Colbert is uh, over on the right, you know, fist pumping. It was it was just great. And, you know, Jemima did the business in the walks. And, yeah, so I felt great for them. It is, um, and really only Mackenzie Little was, was, she was probably the only one who walked away disappointed with what was possible and not being able to meet it and then, Jess Hull was the swing medal as to whether she would get the seventh medal or not, and she did. So, yeah, I thought they they were brilliant. They should be so proud. I think Dave recounted during the marathon that um, there were the seven medals and two other top eight performances, and that's the difference, is to convert top eight into medals rather than be fourth, fifth, or sixth, then you end up with four medals and a whole bunch of top eight finishes. Their, their conversion rate was first class. So that that says a lot about their dedication. It says a lot about the program. It is a it's a nod to Athletics Australia in the way that they've got it going at the moment, and hopefully it's a forerunner. Is there was a lot in this team which was going to pave the way for the future. So they got the here and the now, and I, I reckon they've sort of paved the way for successful days ahead. Now, talking of the marathon, and also talking of Athletics <laughs> Australia, there was the controversy, Jared. We know that mm. in the men's marathon, Brett Robinson pulled out, and they were able to get a replacement two weeks out. There was a lot of rumours. Uh, we heard it back here, the coverage back here, that Shanae Diver was injured with a foot injury, and then it was another injury, and she lasted one point two k's. Lisa Waitman was the reserve, the one who missed out to, uh, of course, Jess Stenson, despite the fact she produced a, a quicker time. Uh, in her marathon in the lead up to the Olympic Games, but she wasn't in Paris. Do you think she should have been in Paris? And do you think maybe Sinead Diver should have been a bit more complicit regarding her injury? Uh, my my feeling on this is all yes. So I don't think it's sort of fully resolved yet with all the suitable information. So the fir first thing to say is the selection of Jess Stenson was spot on. Yeah, They made that choice around the course and the challenges and – championship performances and that was spot on she led the marathon at halfway she finished 13th so a salute right. that was controversial but they nailed it mm -hmm. and then not having lisa in paris i actually don't think you need hindsight that was a mistake is the ethiopians the day before in the men's had had a reserve there they pulled the trigger on their reserve and he ended up winning the race now there's probably some ducks and drakes in all of that but I think that's a pretty good principle to come from. And then there would have been a moment in time with a reserve in place where you could have had what amounts to the grand final fitness test for Sinead Diver is you have to, you have to prove your fitness before you can take the line because running 1200 meters of a marathon and dropping out when there were three others who qualified, that's not really acceptable, is it? No. So yeah, I think there's, there, there's a lot, 
um, in the background, there were a lot of, there's a lot of decisions that might have been made differently that could have led to to a difference on the day that the, the day itself. Now, that's not to, I mean, Sinead is clearly distressed by what's happened yes. and all that surrounds that. And I understand that. And I, I'm sympathetic towards that. I'm a little bit more on Athletics Australia here is I think thoroughness, particularly with what had happened with the men, logic was send the reserve, pick a moment, do a fitness test and everyone can decide how they feel about it. But yeah, I, that, that wasn't a great result. When there were six women who were so prominent, three took the start and one lasted 1,200 metres, that, that, that feels unsatisfactory. I mean, Lisa Waitman said she only needed 72 hours to get there. Can I be a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist here, Jared, and say that if they had have sent Lisa and Sinead pulls out, and she probably should have pulled out before the race, and Lisa does better than both Jess and Genevieve, who did very well as well and was really nice in the comments she made, as you know, about uh, Sinead Diver and the injury and what a great teammate she was, that there would have been egg in their face and it was egg in their face that they, they didn't want. So I, I, I'm going to hope that that's not the case right. because that would be a really poor way to govern your decision-making around it. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I simply don't know the answer to that. But there's... When you when you have it's actually it's actually a good thing to have so many quality athletes and then you put the provisions in place to make sure that you get the best result out of it. It just doesn't feel to me, you know, once they made their decisions and the Waitman camp blew up, I suspect relationships fracture. Yeah. And maybe that does play a role. And it shouldn't have. What yeah. should have happened is the next best athlete should have been on standby the whole way through in case something either unforeseen or that you were warned about transpired and you could have the right athlete on the start line when it mattered most. So I reckon there are, even on the most generous interpretation of what happened, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this and you wouldn't do it the same way again. Well, they had five, as I said to you a bit earlier, five in the women's four by 100 metre relay and they mm. took Ebony Lane out, even though she was in and she was going to run the first leg. And as I said, I spoke to her on the program as well. And she was definitely in and she was definitely in during the games until they made the change. So that fifth athlete, fifth athlete was there. And that wasn't an injury yeah. change. That was a tactic change. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the level of thoroughness that we would expect across the board. I reckon that's a reasonable expectation to have. And, and even if you think about the men's 4 by 100 is neither Browning nor as a party ran in that. Um, so they had that program so well set up that they still broke the national record. They were dead stiff not to be in the final, mm. but uh, so salute. Uh, this is why I don't, I want to, don't want to be critical across the board because a salute, that's exactly the way that it should work. They had six, um, the, the, the top two seeds in a way opt not to run, but the program is so well set up and the training has been th so thorough that those four boys take the track and break the national record, which has stood since the mid nineties. Like that, that's outstanding. It just doesn't feel like the same level of detail that governed there was applied in the marathon scenario. And it, it might've, it, and while it would have been distressing and, and devastating not to be on the start line is we've, we see this in grand finals every year. Teams okay. either take risks and it blows up on them, or there's a really heartrending story where a player misses, but it's for the collective good. I just, yeah, I don't think that was handled the way that it should have been. And Jared, before I let you go, uh, I'm sure you've heard all the talk about break dancing, which is a uh, just <laughs> off in regard to the publicity. Should it have been a sport at the Olympic Games in the first place? And the fact that it was in Paris. And also the fact that it, it got its origins in America, in the ghettos of New York, and LA's the next Olympics, should have they kept it? And what's your view on Ray Gunn? Has she handled this beautifully? <laughs> I reckon she has. I reckon she has handled it yeah, beautifully. Yeah, I suspect that might be right. So my feeling is, is breaking was a mistake. So I'm not, I think I said this to you last time, I'm, I'm totally pro new sports. Mm. I think the rock climbing is, is phenomenal. And yeah, brilliant. Just so great. Re you two stand next to each other, race up that wall and hit the timer. That's sport. I can I yeah. can understand that. I can watch that all day long. Hmm. It was unfathomable what was happening with breaking. So I don't think that that's not a that's not sport. And how it was being scored and 
you know, being in daylight rather than under strobe lighting, I didn't understand any of it unless they were going to throw down like the Sharks and the Jets and sort of fight at the end of it. If there was going to be a rumble at the end of it, then I could have understood that. So not just not appropriate for the Olympics. If it turns out, I feel like the three most profitable athletes out of this game for the next six months will include Ray Gunn. Mm. Like if she doesn't, she'll be on Jungle. She'll be on, oh, no, so that's I'm a Celebrity. She'll be on um, Dancing with the Stars. I don't know. Did she realize in the moment how ridiculous this all was and then played to the, the ridiculousness of it yeah. and the, the notoriety and the fame and the opportunity that comes with that? If she did, big salute because she's um, gamed the system. Um, otherwise, it's all really unfortunate. I think she probably has been failed by her own event. Um, having to dress like a, an Australian one-day cricketer for that just didn't feel like the... So I just... It just... I, it The whole thing confused me. And if she has 12 months' worth of fame out of it, then good on her. And, and hopefully it made the experience worthwhile but no we, we won't be the poorer for not having breaking at the next olympics and we'll I, never see it again i agree jared and of course she's um got a doctorate as well so she's a pretty smart lady as, as that, we know. yes yes and then talking of and that, that i think that i think that's the the risk is that we diminish her as a person because of all that goes around it and that that's the bit that i think is wrong is there's a way to recognize this for what it was and then I hope one day we go, oh, she was just too smart for everyone. Oh, I hope that's what's happened. And what about Snoop Dogg? Money well spent? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it played really well in the US. Yeah. So that's, and I, we saw in the closing ceremony, didn't we? So yes, Paris gave us the, the full French experience, the history, the iconic images, the um, the monuments. The US is going to give us Hollywood. And um, and so it's going to be completely different. But Red Hot Chili Peppers with shirts off, you go, fellas, put your shirts on. You're of a certain age. Um, Tom Cruise, so it's going to be exactly what you think it should be. I did a Super Bowl in LA and it was the full Hollywood show and it was brilliant in a totally different way to what Paris um, to what Paris was. So that they'll be great in their own way. And the fact that they've got SoFi, best stadium in the world, the Coliseum with all the history of the games there. They've got Santa Monica Beach. They'll figure out how to use the Hollywood Hills. So everyone will learn lessons from what happened in Paris and LA will be part of that. But it's going to be garish. It's not going to be charming and historic. It's going to be in your face, full on American pop culture. And so as long as you know what that is going in, that's totally okay. And if you know who's the president, it'll be even more garish than we think it's going to be. Will he be finished by then? Not uh, quite. Be the no, last it'll be, it'll be near, near the end. Right. Near the end. If he gets in, which we hope he doesn't. Right. Like that's, right. that's a story for another day. So <laughs> just imagine what that's going to be like. And and before I let you go, you've gone from one great event back to another back here where we have absolutely no idea, Jared, who's going to win this AFL Premiership, do we? Never been a season like it. Um, it's in it, So it's it's confounding and it's brilliant. Mm. So what, where does it take us? I... I think you and I are a bit the same as Hawthorne's form over three months. So they, they challenge the imagination. Yeah. But if you just coldly boil it down to three months worth of form, like I'm big on your Bulldogs, yes. but they've just got Terrible to make sure that they week. still make it. They've yeah. got to make it. Yeah, they're going to make and, it, Jared. Drive me mad. So you look, at, me mad yeah, you know. look at the ladder and go, yeah. oh, I don't believe in them. I don't believe in them. I don't believe in them. I don't believe. Oh, hang on. Someone's got to win it. So yeah, I can't wait to see what happens next. Cause you know that, this won't change, as I reckon, once the tone is set for a season. There are going to be upsets this week. There'll be upsets next week. So nothing will settle. And then I bet we get upsets in the finals. We'll feel oh. like, oh, well, they're playing in Sydney, so they'll win. I bet that's not what happens. Oh. Is I reckon once you're into a season like this, it takes you the whole journey. And you've just got to, you've got to hang on. You've got to have the imagination for it. So I think we'll get... We're going to get a climax unlike anything we've seen since the Dogs won it in 2016, I reckon. It was the middle of the day when Port were playing Sydney. Did you have to look at the score a few oh. times? It was 70. No, I did too. I was at yeah. a concert and I said, what? No. Somebody, I've forgotten what, what, where we were up to, but somebody showed it to me. And he, no, no, no. What what the hell's going on there? Um, so that made no sense whatsoever. Oh. And, you know, you think about Port's trajectory to be able to produce a result like that, given yeah. the doubts that have swirled around them. So 
yeah, it's um, I'm all in for it. I'm all in for it. And if you want to deal in absolutes and try to pin it down, I think you're going to be uh, you're going to be confused by it. Is just open your mind to where it might take us, and maybe it leads us to the Bulldogs and the Hawks on the last day. Well, I hope so, Derek. I'll, I'll be there, and you'll be, you'll you'll notice me. I'll be on fire, but a uh, <laughs> long way to go. They got, as you said, Jared, they let me down against Adelaide. They were very, very good, as good as they've been all year, and uh, still they got to make it yet. So uh, let's not put the cart before the horse. Now, That's do you right. Got time off at all, or you've got no footy, no. you've got racing, yeah, got cricket. When do you get a rest, Jared? No, I'll pinch a break straight after the footy. So I'll do the Monday after the footy season, but. Um, at this time of year, like you just you just had to get back and get back into the footy, which is so good late. Um, yeah, so I'll steal a couple of weeks after um, after the footy's finished and then be racing into cricket. What what a great summer's ahead of us with India on our shores. So yeah, you 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 wouldn't want to be anywhere else, Dan. Is that oh. that's that's the easiest way to rationalise it? Even if I if I took time off, I'd still be watching all of it, so I may as well be working there. Exactly, Jarrett. You're very lucky, man. Look, thanks so much again for your time before the Games and after the Games. I really appreciate it. It's good that we could have a chat so soon after the Games. You did an outstanding job. You should be very proud of yourself, and uh, we look forward to having you part of the Channel 9 coverage. I know it's still four years away. A lot can change, but I'd be very surprised if you're not there in 2028. And thanks for joining us uh, for Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans. Our areas of expertise are purchasing a property, owner-occupied or investment, building a property portfolio, refinancing, also debt consolidation, cash out, construction, pre-approvals, first home buyers, equipment loans, car loans and personal loans. Enjoy the footy, Jared, and we'll chat soon. Thanks so much. Lovely to share with you, Dan. Good on you.